we know managers always say we're taking things game by game, but when you were driving home from Finch Farm and you were running through that fixture list in your lowest moments, was there any part of you that was fearful about where the points would come from? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Live from the Howard Theatre in Washington, D.C. <laughs> it is incredible to present a night of nights in which we'll laugh and cry will watch Jordan Pickford save that ball with every part of his body. And we'll celebrate one of the things I love most in my life, mighty Everton Football Club. God, it's great to be a blue. And my Lord, the response to tonight has been incredible. This show sold out in minutes. A reminder of just what a footballing hotbed the DMV is. Yes! And what FIFA are missing out on by not holding one Cup games. Yes! God bless you, Washington DC, a city along with Baltimore that was too good and too pure, too uncorruptible for FIFA to touch. <laughs> I love you too, because it's magnificent to be here. I always joke that being an Evertonian is the most important identity that I have. That is how we will approach tonight together, I hope. A night of storytelling about, to be honest, one of the most memorable, emotional footballing campaigns I have ever experienced. Because what Everton did transcends all sports humanly. It really bloody did. My first guest has long been the face of America's Everton connection. A New Jersey boy who displayed the tenacity to assert himself at Everton Football Club as a Blues number one goalkeeper for an entire decade. Welcome, Mr. Tim Howard. Timmy Howard, back with Everton Football Club. When you're back in a club setting as you are the next 48 hours, do you just feel this urge like, give me the gloves, when's training, I'm back? No. Uh, <laughs> I, I, wa I watched those guys out there today, majestic athletes running, getting put to their paces, and there wasn't one ounce of me that wanted to be out there training. <laughs> they, they, are, they are amazing. Frank Lampard, I don't have that attitude. I'm ready. I'll give you a good 90. <laughs> Whenever you want it, I'm here. But Tim, I want to talk to you about the deep, beautiful, profound connection that exists between two of the things I love most outside of my family in this world. Everton Football Club and the United States of America. <laughs> the two go together like Cheech and Chong. <laughs> There's an almost biblical lineage of American internationals who pulled on that Everton shirt. There was a connection started back in 1992 when Precky... <laughs> oh, there's 18 Precky fans alive in the world today, and I think we've got all of them here tonight. Precky, I do love... You know what I love about Precky? 1992. I love in life that one minute you're playing for the St. Louis Storm, <laughs> and the very next, you're hitting bangers at Goodison Park. <laughs> and Precky begat Tulsa, Oklahoma's finest, Joe Maxmore. <laughs> who arrived in 1999 and quickly earned the nickname from the Everton fans, his own fans, Joe Max Less. <laughs> I think we kid because we love. And up stepped the iconic Brian McBride. I'll say few players have had a bigger impact in a shorter time. Four goals in eight games of an important, potent loan spell. But Tim, Brian McBride, yeah. an icon. 
an icon for many reasons, but certainly with the national team. You know, when I when I first broke into the national team, he was the star, and you, they don't get better than that. They don't get better human beings than that. You see, you see the joy in his face scoring for Everton. He was one of the good ones. Then came. He is risen, Landon Donovan. A cult hero. It was beautiful to see a man who realized he could thrive in Europe with gusto. He actually only played 22 games in an Everton shirt, but it gave him cult hero status. From the inside, what's your fondest memory of Landon's time at Everton? Take us behind the scenes. Well, I, I think that, you know, when you look at Landon, greatest ever American player to lace him up. And yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that for me, because I obviously was very close to him at the time with, with, with playing on a national team, he bought into the whole Everton thing. He, he knew com coming over, it wasn't like, I'm just going to hang out and play a few games. He wanted to come to Everton because of what that club meant. And God, did he ever <laughs> in every world. Those are the magic days when we had Stephen Pienaar on the left Oof. playing along with Leighton Baines. Landon gave us a true right threat for the first time. Teams couldn't cheat upon us and how we thrived. And I actually believe this. No club's fan base appreciates Landon so unequivocally more than Everton Football Club. But when we're talking about Everton in the USA, no man stands more giant than you, Tim Howard. <laughs> Thank you. The face of America's Everton connection, a New Jersey boy who reasserted himself at Everton Football Club. 354 Premier League appearances, 116 clean sheets, and one delirious windswept <laughs> goal. This stand tracking him back, and uh, he's not, so quick and powerful. There's no way Chris Eagles is running away from. Uh, Sylvain Destamp. Goalkeeper to goalkeeper, oh it's in! Can you believe that? Tim Howard will take the acclaim! Tim, no celebration. No. Goalkeeper's union. Yeah. But what were you feeling at time? Well, I didn't celebrate as well because I, I, mean, who, I didn't think I was going to score a goal. That wasn't the purpose, right? <laughs> it was, it, it, I was doing my job being ready for a dodgy back pass from Silvana's on his right, right foot. <laughs> I knew it was coming, so I had to make sure I got all, I got all of it, and I did, and, and I mean, yeah. I, I would Listen, for the record, if I scored a goal again, I'd celebrate one trillion percent. <laughs> Jordan Pickford style. <laughs> when you left Everton yeah. in 2016, you said the following, I'm going home to America, but after a decade in blue, this, this is my home. Mm. Everton, you have become a part of my soul. And when I hear you talking about this club, Tim, mm. it really is an echo of the iconic Everton legend, Alan Ball's words, once Everton has touched you, nothing will be the same. He's never been more right. Um, at, like yourself, outside of my children, <sighs> Everton was everything. Every, every good part of my life, memories that I can think of, happened at Everton Football Club. The friends I made, the, the, the wins, the losses, every, everything about it was, was pure. I mean, you think about the hours spent inside those walls. I spent more time with them than I did my family. I spent more time at Goodison and Finch Farm than I did at my home. So it's impossible to not have the feeling. Because if, if I didn't feel right, I'd, I'd have left a long time ago, you know? So it was a place that I wanted to be in my lowest moments. There were times in my life where I was low and I just hung out at the training ground, hung out with the lunch ladies and David Moyes and the physios and just didn't want to go home because that was my safe haven. So it really echoes how I feel about Everton Football Club. And when I think about last year, I was blown away. I, I thought, this, these are the greatest fans in the world. I've lived it. They can't get better. And, and, yet, and yet, somehow, some way, they got better. They lined the streets before the Chelsea game. They stayed after at Leicester, and they sang Frank Lampard's name. They made him come out. It was joyous. It was joyous. You saw the scenes on the pitch when we stayed up. You just thought, they can't get better than this, and yet somehow, some way, they got better. Joy, an all-too-rare 
currency in our day and age. <laughs> <laughs> you beautiful, beautiful blue. I want to say thousands of Americans have become blues because of your commitment mm. to the club. Yeah. And, uh, and we, we, should, we should acknowledge that for this. So unbelievably true. And Washington, D.C., please be upstanding for this man, for your number 24. Let's hear it for Mr. Tim Howard. Okay, are you ready for this? It's time. Buckle up, because we just came off a season of seasons. And I've long joked that I watch football to experience joy, sadness, triumph, defeat, emotions that normal people feel in real life, but I'm dead to inside. <laughs> but I've got to say, last season, last season, I almost felt too much. We all went through this journey together. And tonight, I want to live it out beat by beat with some of the gents who experienced it firsthand. Let's dive in by giving an enormous welcome to a gent who arrived on Merseyside back in January 31st, 2022, as a club legend for another team in blue. It's an incredible joy to welcome to the stage, please be upstanding, for Everton manager, Mr. Frank Lampard! <laughs> so bloody good to see you, mate. Looking, I will say, a lot more relaxed when you last saw you in the technical area <laughs> in those emotion filled weeks back in May. Does that feel like an eternity ago to you? Yeah, I, I suppose it does. Um, managed to have a nice holiday. My wife was so happy that we stayed up because <laughs> we were going to have the worst holidays ever. She, so she was like the, my biggest fan then. So, no, it's uh, yeah, it feels like an eternity, but this is football, it rolls on so quickly. So I had a nice break and now we're back at it, but I'd love to not go through that experience again. We're gonna obviously celebrate it tonight in a way, and it's a weird thing to celebrate staying in the Premier League, but it was, um, <laughs> but we'll take it. And um, from my, well, we'll, I'm sure we'll do a lot of talking from my personal experience. It was just an amazing time and we got the result. You know, when you say it's a, a weird thing to celebrate staying in the Premier League, Matthew McConaughey comes on our show and on his first appearance, I asked him what the secret of life is. And he said, just keep on living. And I was like, I was like Matthew, that's a bit ridiculous, isn't it, mate? And he goes, this is before COVID, before bloody COVID. Matthew McConaughey's motto was in life, just keep on living. And Matthew McConaughey looked at me straight in the eye. He almost burnt out my retina. And he goes, and he goes it's better than the other alternative, isn't it? <laughs> and I'll say the same to you. Celebrate staying in the Premier League because, my God, it is better than the other alternative. <laughs> but we are, we are going to dive into this journey of miracle and wonder. I was speaking to someone at Everton Football Club right after the Crystal Palace game, talking about the experience we've been through. And he told me that after your five and a half months at the club, in which you've come to understand the singularity of it all, Everton Football Club, you had concluded, and I love this quote, that you don't truly understand Everton <laughs> until you're in it. Yeah. What yeah. does that mean, Frank? Um, well, to go back to, those, to the start, um, when I was offered the job, my, my, probably one of my major concerns, obviously the football stuff, we want to stay in the Premier League, but it was um, how all the fans take to an appointment of a, of a London boy, a Chelsea man. Um, and uh, I, I was worried about that because I think you, you, I could see that the club was in a, a difficult time and the negativity that was, that was around the place was something that I think had to go. So I didn't want to add to that. Um, so it, it made my job, my, my first job was, well, how can I um, show the, the Everton fans exactly how I how I am, how I feel, how I care about wanting to do well here. So that was part of my, my thinking in the beginning. And, and the other part is that it's just how I am. You know, there's some, I'm sure oh, there's some Chelsea fans here in the, in the audience. And um, <laughs> we're, we're all friends. We're all friends tonight. And, and, not, and, not, 
<laughs> guys, guys, guys. Then let us beat them 1-0. Can we just... <laughs> just, just, have a, just have a night. Let's just have a night off. No, but my point, my point being, that I, w I was always a very dedicated player and I give my life to the, to the job that I do. And I also... Um, like to understand what the, the, the fan, the person watching the game, the person sat at home, how they feel and what do they want. I think they want honesty. I think they want to see a team with passion and they want to see a manager with passion. So everything I've done has been, has been true. It's been how I am. But it was, um, it was a real understanding. And then I started to feel this kind of effect of what was happening in the club. And even in the difficult moments of some defeats, I could feel a, a, a real desire to get behind the team and it built and it built and it built and it became this incredible animal that uh, is unique to Everton Football Club. And I understood that really quickly and uh, it made me very proud to be a part of it. And I was just desperate in the end behind the scenes to, to stay in the league for, for the fans, for the people that, that work all through the week to come and watch us or, or, or out here, our fans around the world that, that work all week to, to sit and watch us and support us and come to events like this. And that's, that's why we do this job, really. As you say, it was dark when you arrived. I don't want to rehash bad memories, take our audience back to the sunken place. But <laughs> results before you come had been free fall. Morale was low. Key players exited. We had an injury list that was even bigger than Yerry Mina. <laughs> it was not great, Bob. And you walked into a pretty challenged culture is it true that one of the first things you did was take the players and the staff out for dinner so that you could set a new tone of decency and unity? Uh, um, it's, it's, ha it's a half truth because the players didn't come. So <laughs> that, that here, it was not by choice. Like, it's because we came in and very quickly we were playing games regularly. So I wanted it to be a proper night out, you know, and with these modern players, you can't, they, they want to go till four in the morning and, and, you know, so it was like, okay, they're doing that on their own anyway. But I, I think what, what is important, I think, what I, what I realised when you, when, you, when you get the job at Everton is that probably 70% of the staff, at least, are Evertonians. They've all got tattoos everywhere. It's like Everton, 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 every, everywhere is Everton. And so I'll show I, you my Frank Lampard Trump stamp <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> Who hasn't got one of them now, eh? <laughs> my point being that I, I noticed really quickly how much they care. I also felt that they were, uh, when you care that much and you're in a bad place, it's, it's, you know, it's not like you're working in a job where you know, there's no real care into it and you know, you're struggling you kind of think, well, I don't really care as long as I get paid every day or whatever. And it, it wasn't like that. These people really care from the bottom of their hearts. So it was like, okay, well, we, we have to link that and, and buy into how much these people care to the players because the, the club's only as good as the sum of all parts and there are a lot of people that are working hard. So it was just a relaxed night. We had a great night in Liverpool, went for a nice steak night and drink and you end up speaking to people that you wouldn't do on a regular day at work and you have a few drinks and it loosened everything up. And I was surprised by how, how much the staff were like, wow, this is amazing. We haven't done this much before. And I thought, well, these things have to happen. This club has to change a little bit. And we've probably changed th that much because uh, I prioritise results. So some things I kind of let go. Like we've got we've desperation for results. How can we get results? Now we're having a breather. I want to change much more as we go along. And after seven games, you summoned the performance worthy of the Churchill War Rooms against Newcastle with 10 men on the ropes and a 99th minute Alex Awobi goal. And I think, whoops! But that three points proved to be a fleeting joy. Losses to West Ham, even more devastatingly Burnley. We're going to stop playing teams in Claret and Blue. It was about this time every single pundit started to compare run-ins. And I've got to be honest, ours felt like a descent into Dante's nine levels of hell. <laughs> Everton still had to play Manchester United, Leicester twice. Liverpool, Chelsea, yeah. Watford, Brentford, Palace, Arsenal. You can be honest now. We know managers always say we're taking things game by game, but when you were driving home from Finch Farm and you were running through that fixture list in your lowest moments, was there any part of you that was fearful about where the points would come from? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> no. oh, it's yeah, the I'll end of the show. I don't think we're going to do better than that. 
Listen, it could, it'll be a long night if, I want, if you, you want me to talk through all the moments I had with my staff in the office, finding a way, how can we get a result, what, what can we do to change this? Because the Premier League is so unforgiving. And when you're in a bad run of form, it's really hard to see the next win or you know, to keep lifting players that are... And I kept saying this in the media, really good lads, desperate to stay in the Premier League, working hard. You know, some are low in confidence, we've got some injuries, there are lots of things, everything was kind of piled on top of each other. Um, but so to, to keep, you know, trying to be the positive one is quite draining, you know, because like you say, when I'm at home, I'm like stressing out, where's the next point coming from? And then when I go into training, I'm like, right, lads, we're going to win this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fine. You know, and that's your job. You know, I think the, the greatest coaches and managers I played under some of them, they're actors or bullshit. <laughs> I don't know. It's part of the job. And, and it's not, you know, and it's not a bad thing. You have to be honest with the players because if you're a bullshit, to the players, you'll lose their respect. But what you have to do is try and create a, an environment where um, you as the, as the leader, as the man in charge, have to be the first one. So when I drove home from Burnley, it was a tough night, that. It was a tough night. We were, it was raining, three points down the drain in the last 20 minutes of the game, a game that was in control. Everything flipped on it. Nine-point gap if we'd have won, three points, or whatever it was, because we lost. But I have to go to bed and wake up and be the positive one when we play Manchester United on Saturday morning. So that was my job. You think it's shattering being the positive one, Frank. You should try being the negative one. It's, <laughs> it's exhausting. Um, to the United game. And I'm going to be honest. Before I went to bed the night before the game, my wife said to me, she's American, she said, as long as I have known you, a whole relationship, you've had Everton in the Premier League to shout at at the television. And she said to me, what would you be without that? And I honestly didn't know how to answer. And I know blues around the world all felt the same in our darkest hours. The sense of doom felt palpable. It felt unstoppable, Frank. It mm. really did. And into the United game, you said there's nine games. We've got to give absolutely everything. I will do that. Everybody has to do the same. And the players responded. I'm going to bring on a guest who can help us relive this moment. It's a genuine delight to welcome to the stage Mr. Anthony Gordon. <laughs> You are a Liverpool lad. You were born in Kirkdale. You joined Everton at age 11. As Frank said, a brutal run of games. You're heading into a match with Manchester United in desperate need of points. They needed them too. And from the kickoff, the football was nervy, it was anxious. United controlled the ball. There was lots of errors in the early exchanges. Jordan Pickford doing his thing, unleashing save after save. And I want to know, what's it like to play games like this, mentally? Games of such incredibly high stakes, such immense pressure. What does it feel like? Can you describe for us? It's hard to really describe. I've obviously never been in that position before. But I can't lie, it is really difficult. Um, and I understand why teams you know, are so together in, in them times because you have to be because that's the only thing really dragging you through them moments and them games and that game was really tough at the start they had a lot of the ball and I think the nerves didn't really settle until the final whistle the goal helped but the final whistle <laughs> killed the game off for us oh the goals they always <laughs> bloody help <laughs> but what I do remember about this game from the off was the sunshine Goodison Park packed almost 40,000 fans and when I watch you play it seems like there are few players who feed more off that energy than you when they sing, oh, Anthony Gordon. What do you hear? And what does it feel like when you're actually playing? Can you hear it? Yeah, I can definitely hear it. Goodison's one of the loudest grounds in the Premier League. Um, so I can definitely hear it, and I love to hear it. Like you said, I, I literally thrive off that stuff, and it makes me a much better player. So amazing, he said after this game, he said, to hear the fans chatting my name against United was probably the best moment of my life. I've dreamed about it since I was a kid. So I probably enjoyed that more than the goal. Yeah, genuinely, I've, I used to love like, football songs as a kid, like when I was a ball boy and stuff. So I used to buzz off the, the football songs. So to have my own, 
and scored the win against United and them sing my name, it was like, I've literally dreamt of that. So it was, it was unbelievable. In the 27th minute, <laughs> you did this. Charleston able to pick it up, but it's just taking an extra couple of seconds. In towards Iwobi. This is Gordon. How does it feel to score a massive goal like that and then charge away and knee slide towards a delirious park end? Yeah, I don't think when you score goals or you do something impactful, I don't think you really understand until after the game. But in that moment, I really felt it. Like I felt the adrenaline rush through my body and it was like, like I said, it was literally the best moment of my life. But I felt it in the moment. So I was just buzzing. That second half... With a goal lead to defend, it felt like a cosmic eternity. It really did. How does time pass like this when you're a manager on the sideline? No, it's agony. It's agony. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about it because you, you care so much. Your job is to be the, the difference maker if you can be off on the side of the pitch. I mean, these boys are the difference makers on the pitch. You rely on them. But your job is to be as close to that as you can be. Um, and then when, it, when there's so much on it, and there was so much on that game off the back of the Burnley game, and you understand that Manchester United have threats that at any second something could happen, Ronaldo at the end and Jordan makes an incredible save, then you're, you know, it's, it's a really tough thing. But you know, for, in management, I, you know, I had a long career as a player, and Anthony's right, scoring is the best feeling in the world, there's no doubt. But when you go- Like into, you did against Germany. Yeah, that was <laughs> sort of good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like my most famous goal is the one that isn't actually a goal. It's really <laughs> weird. <laughs> in management, the, the, the wins are greater than they were as a player and the losses are worse. So you have this real jeopardy of every game where you stand there for 90 minutes waiting to see how, uh, how your reading's going to be with your wife when you get home. Do you know what I mean? Because it's a disaster, I'll cancel dinner. If we lose, if we win, I'm the party boy, I'm the main man. <laughs> not, not quite, you know, I might have been when I was 20 or so, but, no, but as, as a manager, you, you do have that. And then and also just the weight of the, the club on your shoulders, like you're saying, we, we, you know, so many Evertonians in the room, around the world, in the stadium at the time, you know what it means to them, it's their life, and we are, we're the ones that can go out and make that difference. So the players are, first and foremost, but as a manager, yeah, it can be really, it can be tough. And you mentioned the players, so many Everton heroes down that stretch. And at the final whistle, we had won, 1-0, what a day, clean sheet. And at the final whistle, Anthony, you hugged the Corre and Seamus Coleman. And I love this, this was one of the youngest players on the field, Anthony Gordon hugging Seamus, who's been at the club for 13 years, the club captain. What? What does it feel like in that moment? Because it is a beautiful image for me. I was like, that is the youngest gent. What a killer. With the guy who really felt it most. What was it? Was it relief? Was it shock? Was it joy? I think it's a mixture. I think, like, the emotional stress of that game, like, the way it started, how well they were playing, and the way we grinded it out, it was pure emotional stress just coming out between us. I think you can see, like, a young player and a player at a different stage of his career. So, like, he, he probably understands the situation a lot more than me at that moment. So, you know, he's probably... And he thanked me for the goal as well, so... <laughs> <laughs> Frank, I've got to ask you, this gent right here is just 21 years of age, and you've seen and played with so many bloody good young players. But even some of the best of them haven't been able to make a difference in seismic, pressure-packed Premier League matches like this one on this day. What is it about Anthony's mentality that makes this possible? You can close your ears now. Yeah, I don't. Because I'm going to speak really well of him. And I don't, I, like it's an just, old it's just, show into the soundproof no, booth. He can't have one week where he gets a number 10 shirt and <laughs> the manager speaking really well. I could lose, I could lose him. Uh. <laughs> no. Um, no uh, listen, when, when you're going to get a job, and I knew I was getting a job, uh, at Everton you sort of analyse the squad you look at the players I watched a lot of games I saw Anthony playing and then you go okay well what are they, they going to be like when you meet them the players on the training ground and, and what Anthony gave off on day one was um, talent clearly um, a dedication uh, a hunger a drive an intelligence and when I say that I'm saying like a, an intelligence of what it takes to be a top player because the best players in the world understand what they need to do to get better and they're quite humble about it it's like okay I've got these tools 
but how can I be the, the, the top end players that produce, you know, Mo Salah, Kevin De Bruyne, whatever, you can, you can name them all. Um, and they have a desire to get there and what are the, what's the path to get there. And then Anthony, I saw that straight away. And then he, and then he just performed. And you, we joke about him and the Seamus comparison and stuff, but you know, a squad needs a real mixture of, of attitudes and types. Seamus is, I said it before, one of the, the greatest professionals and people I've met in football. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. He's, you, you, talk, you talk about like the, the weight of what happened in the last few months. Seamus was wearing it but was more than anyone, in my opinion, and, yeah. and, he, and he actually delivered. But back to Anthony, I think a young kid who fills the, the, the city, fills the club, he's a reference for all the fans. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it was an easy choice for me. People kind of go, oh, you love Anthony Gordon like you used to love Mason Mount. These boys make you love them because they deliver and, and, they, and they work hard. And now there's much more to come from him. And as I, I say that in a, in a positive way because... And he trains. I'm not scared to say that because I know when we train tomorrow, he'll be going, what can I do to be better? And that's, that's the best thing. Just how good can he be? Yeah, he can, he can be whatever he wants. I know it's, it's hard to say when you're sitting t like a yard away <laughs> from him. By the way, yeah. <laughs> way, the next question I've got for you is, how good can I be? So you <laughs> well, you know, he can be. As I say, he's got absolutely all the talent. Um, he's, got, he's got the right attitude. Uh, so for me... The next stage for Anthony is, you know, what, what are you going to deliver us next year, you know, in, in terms of goals and assists on top of that thing. And that's just normal. That's development of a player. And then you talk about England and all these things. Everything's there for Anthony. I can, I can say it next to him again because it, it won't go to his head. It'll just keep working. Anthony asked me to ask you that question. So, <laughs> <laughs> done it. I don't know how it helps. But last question to you, Anthony, because in good times, everyone feels and plays amazing so much easier, lighter, more joyful. But in football, as in life, you do learn true lessons about true character in times of adversity. And I watched you down that stretch time and time again. It was you actually taking responsibility, stepping up, trying to do everything you could to save this club, which you ultimately bloody did. And I want to ask you, what's the most important lesson you learned about yourself in the process last season? I think that I could handle it. Um, I didn't think I would be able to, maybe like a couple of years ago when I was a young player coming through, but being thrown into the situation and, and sort of growing into a big role towards the end of the season, I just kept putting more pressure on myself more than anyone else could put on me. So I was ready for, for whatever was thrown at me towards the end of the season. Oh, thank God for that, Anthony Gordon. Thank you for all the joy you've given Blues around the world to you your continued success and all the wonders to come. Thank you. Let's hear it for Anthony Gordon. But the season ultimately came down to the crucible of May. Six games, 22 days that would determine our top flight fate. But at one point, Frank, there was a five-point gap between Everton and safety. And we were getting a visit from Chelsea. And I don't know if you know this, Frank, but you used to play for them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Premier League scriptwriters are such cruel, cruel bastards. But here's what I want to know. Down the stretch, every game's so vital. Did you ever fear that you were going to run out of inspirational team talks and how to keep them fresh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, how, do you, how do you do it? Like, what do you, no, it's, it's an interesting point. Rallying cries, those type of, 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 uh, sort of generic team talks where you kind of come on, dig in, give us everything. I think if you say it every week, it kind of loses effect. And when you're in a tough corner, that if you hit, keep hitting the same thing, then I think the players can go, OK, all right, not another Winston Churchill type attempt. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Uh, so I think you've got to balance that out and pick and choose your times. The Chelsea one's a good example because the evening before the game, the afternoon before the game, the day before, Burnley are playing Watford. I'm driving from Finch Farm, our training ground, to the hotel where we're about to stay at. I'm listening on the radio to Burnley Watford. So Watford go one up. So I'm like, get in. So I'm, I'm driving... <laughs> 
driving in the car and, and there's nothing worse um, than listening to football on the radio because you can't see it so you, so you rely on the commentator to be kind of like calm and every time it went near the Watford goal the commentator was getting all excited and then they didn't score so I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm tense sweating driving to, to, to the hotel get to the hotel for the second half sitting there and it's hang on and it goes 2-1 to Burnley um, so from being uh, two points in the relegation zone with games in hand, all of a sudden it's five. It's a big number. Five feels bad because it's Chelsea the next day. So it was a really, um, not a difficult night, but I know that as much as I feel that, every player feels that, uh, every member of staff feels that, every, every Evertonian feels that. So it added to the, what was going to be the next day. So I had a couple of beers in, with the staff in, in the hotel that evening, couple stroke four or five. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, and um, and we're talking and we're going over things and you know, like you go over everything. And then I, I decided that on the morning before the game that I was going to not, I'm not going to give away exactly what I said to the players and I'm not giving it the big in here. This wasn't the speech that won the game. The players always win the game. But I, I said some things that I felt I'd been feeling for the last weeks and months, a couple of months, um, which I'd held back on. And I said them about what was on this game and what was on it for the fans at home and what was on it for people that are employed at Everton Football Club. Um, and at five points be behind, if we lose that game, then we're in serious trouble. So I, I felt that that was my time to do that sort of, sort of talk. Um, and then the players make it land because they went out and performed. The, the effort and the desire of that performance against a very good Chelsea team was, was superb. Five is a massive number. We were five deep going into that Chelsea game. And I want to bring on a gent now who, for me, was our player of the season, really a cult hero of the English game. He does it all with wrists of steel, level of passion, turn up to 11. He's always getting the rave on. It's Mr. Jordan Pickford. Jordan. I want to take you back in time. Head of the Chelsea game, Everton bus, turn on to Goodison Road, 90 minutes before kickoff. It was met by a spectacular sight. Thousands of Everton fans, all ages, generations, come from different parts of the city, from all over the bloody world, turning the Goodison Park sky blue with flares, passion. Take us onto that team bus, emotionally, mentally. What was it like as players? Yeah, it was incredible. Um... I remember being on the bus, turning around, seeing the flares, and uh, I couldn't sit down really. I was standing up just watching it go by, and all the lads were just buzzing on, <laughs> on edge really, and uh, it was incredible. It was a great experience. Another beautiful moment, one that actually now seems like a bloody prophecy before kickoff, the Gladys Street raised an enormous Jordan Pickford Tifo. <laughs> and look at that. In the club's hour of need, a vote of unwavering confidence and love for you. What does that feel like to witness when you come out? Yeah, you've got to pinch yourself, really. Um, when I see that come out, and I just feel like I'm liked, I'm loved at the club, and it's a massive club for me, and I'm really enjoying it. And when you see that, and you're putting all the hard work in, and the fans are chanting for you, not just for me, for the, the team itself, it's an it's amazing feeling. You know, into the game itself, lots of fight, but goalless at half-time. Frank, I don't know what you said at half-time, but bloody hell it worked, because <laughs> 61 seconds into the second half, a moment of sheer human bloody wonder, this happened. We have won at Manchester United in the week. Here's to Maury Gray, there's I think when you play a team of Chelsea's quality and you realise that there's still a long way to go in the game, uh, as much as you're, you, know, you, you have that exhilaration of, of a goal, um, as, a, as a manager you straight away you're thinking, OK, how are we going to see this out? So you, you continually think that through the game and, uh, and you have, hope that the players have the desire to dig in and be organised and the work ethic and, and you hope that things go your way. Some of that sometimes is a stroke of luck, some of it sometimes is a stroke of brilliance and there's your man. God, because Chelsea, Chelsea did what they can do. They laid siege to the Everton final third and Jordan Pickford, you honestly unfold one of the most transcendent goalkeeping performances of the season. Let's take a look. Alonso, 
Havertz, Mason Mount off the post, Aspilicueta, and clawed away by Pickford. Extraordinarily, that that didn't look possible. I try my best to be next level, so. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I was watching at home and I thought about something that you said to me when you came on our show last year. A beautiful phrase. You said, sometimes I can't keep the celebration in me. (laughs) Which I absolutely adore. And within seconds from the corner, we had the Rudiger moment. Could be worth millions. It's in by Mount. Loftus-Cheek, Rudiger! Wow, what a block! He's taken it hard. It has hurt him badly, but it is a simply magnificent save. What you remember about this moment, or is it like, because I've got to be honest, he hit that ball so hard at you. I got a headache just watching. Well, well, I definitely didn't make the 10 count. I was, (laughs) my my head was absolutely bouncing straight away. I was just waiting for Adam, the physio, to come on and just give us a breather. But, you know, when the first shot, when the first shot um, off I split a quarter, I knew I had to be switched on straight away because I've had moments where you make a good save, then the next moment a goal goes in, so I just I was ready for that moment. And oh. Finally, an agony over. Peter Drury bellowed, Frank Lampard beats Chelsea! Everton, 22% possession, sod possession. Final whistle. What were you experiencing in that moment? Probably still concussed off the ball off Rudy there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was absolutely drained. I put everything into the game and it was just like a big relief. Do you know what I mean? I do know what you mean, Jordan Pickford. I do know what you mean. And I've got to ask you, Frank, what was it like watching this man, a gent who in the past has taken tons of sh- because he cares a lot when the chips are down, who wouldn't want somebody like this on their team? A gent who put half a city on his back in the fight for survival. And I want to say, what have you got to say about this gent and where his performances rank in terms of the goalkeepers that you've seen? Firstly, the reason he takes tons of sh- is because he's a brilliant football player. And if you play at the highest level, and particularly if you're England's number one, and the minute you get the, 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 the jersey, as you'd say, someone wants to take it off you or say why it should be taken off you so that's that's a real pressure that no one will understand other than Jordan and England goalkeepers um in terms of how is it to work with Jordan I think I'm I've been I was lucky enough to play with fantastic goalkeepers Peter Cech mainly you know and um but what I would say is when you coach and when you manage like it's, it's such a funny world because you can you're a genius if you win and you're useless if you lose and sometimes you're just reliant on brilliant players doing their job and when you're talking about goalkeepers you can't do anything in this sport in this field unless you have goalkeepers that that can do things like that because that's three points the Jordan's three points when you score it in the top corner to be fair this saves a different level this save is not save of the season for me that's save of the Premier League era personally I, I really believe that I really believe that no it's a different level because I, I don't I don't, know, I don't know the tactics of goalkeeping or the technical aspects of it. Speed of getting up and getting across a technique of changing at the last second is something that you, know, you, you work on so hard. But what Jordan's done there is just a culmination of huge talent, dedication, hard work. He's a dream to work with because he, he gives everything every day on the training pitch. And that's not always the norm. And that's what top players do. Jordan's been a great goalkeeper for a long time. And outside of Everton, maybe people <laughs> want to maybe sort of shout that down. Now no one can say anything. You said after the game, you said it's always nice to have that legacy of a save, but I'm a team player, a club player. It's about staying up. Spoiler alert, we did stay up. (laughs) And I want to know, in that season, that end of season, what was it that you learned about yourself in the process? Um, A lot, really. I just knew my performances, if I work hard and... I knew I was in a good place, you know, my form was good and I knew I could help the team and when called upon, found myself as a bit of a leader as well, helping the, helping the team out. You see, as people see, I, I shout too much on the pitch, but I'm actually help, trying to help my teammates to get a result and um, 
bit bit commanding really, but yeah, I think learn learn myself as a bit of a leader to help the team. One thing I think we can all agree on: every single Everton fan cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Down that stretch, it was honestly you more than anyone who carried us to safety. Let's hear it for England's number one, Jordan Pickford. Thank you. Frank, I gotta ask you, can you sleep after games like that? How long does it take for the adrenaline to burn off? No, it's tough. You, you can't really. It takes, it takes a while and you go over everything. The adrenaline's clearly there. So no, you stay up late and um, go over it. You know, as I say, the, the good and the bad, the bad ones you stew over them, the good. It's easy said now, but after that game, my mindset changed. Because even though we went to two points shy of, I think, Burnley, I looked at our running and I looked at the games that were coming up. Leicester was a tough game, but I looked at Brentford and Palace at home and I fancied us at Goodison. Um, so I thought we had enough points in us off the back of what that performance meant and Watford away it was, yeah. God, the good vibes we felt in that moment into that Leicester game, taking just six points on the road all season. But we headed to the house of Brodge and we emerged victorious. Three and a half thousand stayed well after the final whistle, cheering the team. And um, we're only going to briefly mention a nil-nil draw already relegated Watford. <laughs> <laughs> Point's a point, guys. Uh, I will completely not mention that agonising 3-2 loss to Brentford in which we had as many red cards as goals. Everton, aren't we? We've got to do the hard miles and it all led to the penultimate game of the season. To clinch safety, we had to beat Crystal Palace at home. A game that was hailed as the biggest Everton game of a generation. This game, honestly, I still don't know what the hell happened. What we witnessed, I'm trying to like make sense of it with you here tonight. So let us bring on our next guest. When we needed a hero, he was the streetwise Hercules who could fight the rising odds. It's a genuine delight to welcome Mr. Dominic Calvert Lewis. Oh, Dom. God, it is great to see you. Last time you were here, in America, it was New York Fashion Week. Few gents love being in America more than you. How does it feel to be back? Feels great to be back. Um, I love, I love the states. The weather, the people are friendly, um, and uh, yeah, it just feels good to be back. You had struggled with injury for long spells of the campaign. Can you talk about your mindset when you came back into the squad and you joined that fight? Yeah, it was. A, I think everyone knows it was a difficult season for me. Um, with the injuries and things like that. So I think as a player, sometimes you go through moments like that where you have to dig deep and, and keep working, keep going. It's difficult when, especially when the, the team's in a difficult moment and you want to be there to help your teammates and things like that. So me and, and the person that I am, I just tried to do everything that I could to, to get back fit. And, you know, I had a bit of a few ups and downs when I came back, but nice to, you know, play my part in the end. Another massive game. Another Mardi Gras carnival level atmosphere. Almost too much mania around Goodison Park. And that first half, Crystal Palace, those bastards had nothing to play for. Half time, 2 0 down. Honestly, what did you feel? What did you tell yourself? I think, obviously, I've never been in a situation with that amount of pressure on, on a game. But I think it's like any game you go in at half time, 2 0 down. And you just keep thinking, like, if we score the next goal, the, the tables can turn. And I think. That game had everything and we scored, Michael scored at the perfect time. And then you just felt the, the atmosphere change in the stadium, the fans got behind us and you just couldn't help but feel like things were going to turn for us. And then Richie got the equaliser and then from then you're just thinking this is our night. And I think the crazy stat was that we'd, we'd not come from behind, from 2-0 down in a long, long time. So to do it in that occasion, this was a special night. I had all my own hair when we last came from 2-0 down. <laughs> It was 1917, in between the wars, and it was magnificent. We did an interview about two years ago, and you didn't. <laughs> Take us into that walk into the locker room at halftime. Like, how do you even compose thoughts? What is going through your head? What did you even draw on for inspiration? Ooh, um, I'm not sure what I, what, I, what I drew on for inspiration. I, um, I felt like everybody. Like, you're only human, aren't you? And, and when... Uh, 
you two 0 down in such a critical game. I think you know you'd, I'd be a liar if I sat here and, and said, oh, you know, come on, lads, this is going to change. You're going to win 3-2. Like that wasn't there at the time. So it's basic messages, like Dom said there. The next goal is the crucial one. We changed the system just before half time to 4-3-3. Um, we brought Delhi on at half time, which was you know huge. No, nobody realised my master plan to wait <laughs> for the last 45 minutes to, to, to really get him so pumped up that he was going to come on and change everything. So, no, but it, Delhi came on and it was like, it was you know, not a throw of the dice, but we had to be aggressive. The game was going to open up. Can we score the next goal? Because Goodison Park is one of the, one of the grounds that when the game turns in our favour from whatever position it is, anything can happen. I knew that as a... As a, as a as a Chelsea player coming to Everton, many a time, feel like you're in control of a game, no problem, next minute, bang, goal, cross, corner, bang, goal, and the, and the whole stadium changes, and, and it happened for us, so I just tried to keep the lads positive at half-time, and even if I wasn't completely positive in my own head, I was like, this could go anyway, but you know, I shouldn't be saying it in front of the lads now, but sometimes you've got to fake it a little bit and go, don't worry lads. You've got this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you did say after the game that you told them it was emotions and character, not tactics, which would determine the outcome now. And DCL, you all did retake the field like a collective of men who knew they were in the fight of their lives and that they could either expire or go down swinging. When you've got a momentum change like that in a game, can you describe what it feels like as a player? The adrenaline... Do you stay focused, or are you also just running around like losing your crap? <laughs> a little bit, but I think um, now nah, as, as a player, you can feel it. It's you, you kind of stay composed, and you're almost in a, like a flow state, like you're in the zone. So you get the goal, and, and you start to believe, and then it starts to become real. So. And there's a striker. I love you. Dom's on to me. I wondered why he was pointing at me. Dom, Dominic, Dom, oh, no, no, no. I've, been, I've been doing this. I've been doing this crap for like 58 years, and like I realised when you point at people, they like get excited and they say good shit back. Dominic, <laughs> oh, I, just want, I just want to acknowledge Dominic Cameroon is the first person that's ever just gone. <laughs> <laughs> levels, fucking levels. As a striker. Do you feel an extra urge, like, I want to step up, I want to deliver the coup de grace? Of course, it's, it's my role to, to score the goals for the team, and I carry that kind of responsibility with pride. It's a position I work very hard to get into, so I think off the back of the difficult season I'd had, when I had times off the pitch and in, in, in injuries, I kept believing that I was going to be the one to make the difference, so I think it's more so the, the positive state of mind you've got to try and keep yourself in, which then allows you to produce moments like that. Frank, I've got to ask you, you've been involved in some pretty bloody epic comebacks in your career. As anyone who remembers Chelsea Barcelona 2012 can attest. So are you on the sideline understanding exactly what is happening? Been there, seen <laughs> this, I know what I said, yeah, this is going to happen. When Kino scored, I felt that the whole atmosphere and the tone change in the stadium. And then I felt some belief because you need something to hang on to. At 2-0 down, it feels a long way away. So... You know, I was so pleased with the reaction in the second half. You could feel instantly as we came out, which is, the, like I said, not so much tactics, it's the players, what they do. Um, and then Kino's goal changed, Richie, and then we seriously started to believe. And, and I'm Mr. Pessimist. I'm like, this, <laughs> the worst can happen before I think about the good stuff. <laughs> That's probably why I fit with Evertonians, though. <laughs> it's going to go bad, surely. <laughs> but you know, like sometimes it can be like that in life, can't it? You kind of, uh, you know, even when you get to two-two or what may be. But with this game, it was different, and the, the crowd and the players. There was something. It's easy said now with hindsight, but there was something in the evening in the air that, that made you feel that this this was going to turn. And then, in the 85th minute, <laughs> this happened. Drawing at the moment, Gray. Sends it in, brilliant goal! Donald Calvert-Lewin! A comeback of enormous importance! Play again. The emotions that you experienced in this second 
When does it rank for you as a footballing moment? Personally, it ranks with the Champions League final, I've got to say. Because it's, and I'm not, I'm not belittling in the Champions League final. It's the biggest achievement I had in my career to be part of a team and a club that do that. So I'm not belittling that, but every, football's relative. And um, so when you come into a situation at Everton, you, you go through the three months, you have some tough times and you have an evening like that. You just, you just, at that point, you're just a bloke who's feeling this incredible emotion and nothing's, as I say, it goes right to the top of my list because of what it meant to so many people and the, the pent up, everything that had been building up over the few months, the bad results, the tough times, the good results. That was the moment when you know that you've done it. Well, not quite then. We had another seven or eight minutes of hell. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but at that time, when Dom headed it in, I was right behind it with my angle as the ball came in. It was so flush, wasn't it, that you called it bang straight back in the corner. And um, it was, yeah, it's right up there for me, I have to say. The final whistle. Everything, everything is contained in there. And the crowd stormed the field. The players stayed on the pitch to revel amongst them. Fans mobbed you. Give us a sense of what you were feeling in this second. The final whistle had just gone and there was so many fans like here. And, and I remember thinking, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And uh, just like, just pure, pure emotion and almost relief really, I think, for the collective, for the fans, the club, the players, all the work that we put in, but then personally, the, the, the journey that I'd been on last season for me to, you know, produce that moment and just just kind of just be in the moment with so many fans and everyone just so, so happy. It's a, it's a moment that will live with me forever and I think the picture, you know, says a thousand words. Your team had been knocked out. They were dead on their feet, 2-0 down at half-time, but they looked death in the eye and said, not today. They lived out the lyrics of Spirit of the Blues with the world watching... How do you explain it to yourself now? We're all calm now, right? How do you explain what happened in that second half? What did we all witness? Well, what we did, we found a way, and it's what we did in that running. And um, for me as a coach, um, it was the biggest test of my pretty short career so far as a coach. I've been, been fortunate enough to work with teams that have a lot of possession and you have different expectations. Every job's tough. But with this, we were in a position where we knew we needed to, to do the things we needed to do, and they were the basics. They were work hard, be together, be, co be a collective. We got together as a club, we got together as a squad, the players fought and, and dug in, um, and we've got quality in, in the squad. So um, that's what wins your games in the end, things like Dom's performance, like the, the three lads have had here tonight, they're the game changers. So what we need to do now is understand we don't want to be there again. As much as it's an incredible moment that will live with us all forever, We'll take comfortable tents next year, maybe, as it stands, you know what I mean? No, we, we want more and more as we go, but the, we need to make the changes now. So hopefully, as a club, my job now is to keep working, um, keep improving the squad, which we need to do, which we're in the process of trying to do now, and, um, and keep working in the right direction and, and get us going in the, the way we want to go. Last question for you. Was that more than a goal? Was it proof that the hardest things... The greatest challenges often make the deepest memories. Absolutely. It's like the gaffer said, you know, ideally we don't want to be in that situation, but then the outcome that, that came from it produces such, such special memories and, and heightened emotion. So I think, like I touched on before, when you go through difficult times to come out of it on top and show the resilience to everybody, but also to yourself to, to pull through and, and come out on top is, is the most important thing. Frank, Dom said after the game that what he learned was the paradox of true strength is being able to face your weaknesses, which I think is genuine. I've thought about that so bloody much. Did you actually say that? Quote. Did you? <laughs> he must have I'm found a part -time that. part-time poet. He must have read that. He's read that somewhere, hasn't he? The, <laughs> the, the paradox of true strength. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely agree with it. <laughs> it was perfectly put. So let's pretend there's not a thing called Google where we can like, where we can like check on this. Hang on, hang on. Don't, don't, you, don't finish your Dom on that from me. Because, <laughs> no, because he's, it, the quote is right and it's really apt for Dominic's situation. I won't go back over what you just said, but I came into it. Dominic was having injury problems, was trying everything to get back, trying all the right things and it wasn't quite coming off. 
And it's easy from the outside to look at that and people go, oh, where's Dominic? We should be scoring our goals. He's trying everything to get fit. He got fit and he produced because he's a great lad who works hard, he's got a great talent. And, um, so, and, and I think the, the biggest story that you said about life, and I think Dominic will speak about this, I, I had lots of things in my career and in my life, as we all do. It's an inspiring story, that's why we're all so excited about it. But Dom personally deserves a huge amount of credit for how he handled the season. <laughs> he does. Dominic Calvert-Lewin. I want to thank you for your poetry, for your football, for the way you approach life, to be candid, but more than anything, for that goal, for that moment, for the opportunity to end the torment of the season, to deliver in our hour of need, and just share that final scene of love, really a love forged of formative Everton memories that everyone was tapping into together. That, to me, is the beauty of football, and on this night, Mate, you laid it bare. Ladies and gentlemen, with great, great thanks. Let's hear it for Dominic Calvert Lewis. Thank you very much. Thank you for the pop. But, Frank, we lived, we lived. So many heroes. And I want to ask you what's the big life lesson that you learned? through managing Everton Football Club that you didn't know when you walked into Goodison Park back January 31st, 2022? Uh, a couple of things. The, the, the first thing is, on a personal note, I realised that I'm, that I'm pretty tough. It was a tough road. And for me, in my, in my, in my professional career, it was probably the toughest period of my um, career as a whole um, because of what the stakes were, Everton to be relegated. You know, you could, it, was, it would have been such huge news. And the second thing and the most important thing I learned that football, as much as it's about tactics and kicking the ball and Dominic hitting that header, it's about people. And I absolutely, I absolutely learned that. And it's about um, my, my job, my, my job in, in the, at the training ground and, and at Goodison and through the week and through the season is to get the players in the best place that they can be as people and get them confident and surround them in the environment. Uh, the staff that we spoke about earlier that then relates to the fans, and that exactly, when you get something positive in the right direction, it's much more important that the tactics is, is quite right. It's, it's really apt that that second half was nothing to do with tactics. It was about emotion and people and everyone coming together. That's what I really learned. One of the truest and most magical parts of the journey was watching the fans, the fans as the antidote, the unflinching support, every single home game down that stretch was transcendent. Frank. There were so many bloody heroes on this journey, so many of them in your front office, so many of them on your staff, so many of them in the back office, across the Everton organisation, the players, of course, the players, but above all, you, because football is supposed to be about memories and moments of feelings, of really feeling alive, and it was not always easy, but you enabled all of us to feel all of that and more. And we want to wish you strength and love and health for the season ahead. But God, Frank Lampard, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it. Frank Lampard! God speed, courage, love you. God's up. Subscribe here for more Men in Blazers videos and courage. Go, go, go.